Well, we're coming back with breaking news because the live stream has finally started. You can see that right there. About 28 or so minutes late, but nonetheless, it is underway. Um, and we'll see exactly what, what's gonna, gonna happen there. Andrew Left still standing by. We'll give you updates when they happen. Um, you judge for yourself what's going on on your screen. Coming up today, Roaring Kitty's live stream, the media's reaction, will regulators shut them down? Why did GameStop crush the rally? Not all is as it seems. The jobs report comes in hot, a deeper look at the numbers, why gold got whacked, and a preview of important events coming next week. I've got a real interesting one for you today, guys. And before I get into it all, just a huge thank you to everyone who tuned into the daily market review yesterday. We hit a new all time record for the amount of viewers that were watching yesterday. And so a big thank you to everybody who hits that like button and continues to support this channel. And a big welcome to all my new subscribers here. And just a quick intro about me and what I do for you guys. My name's Jared. I've been passionate about trading and investing in financial markets for over 20 years. I worked for a large investment bank up until 2008 before I quit. And since then, I've been trading, investing, and working for myself. And nowadays, apart from trading and investing, I really enjoy bringing you these daily market reviews every day after close. And if you're interested in learning a bit more about me and what I have to offer, then check out the links below this video and be sure to hop on my email list as well if you'd like to hear from me a bit more regularly. But without any further ado, let's dive right in to all today's events happening across financial markets. And let me get you updated going into next week as well. So starting off, as always, just looking at the S&P 500 and giving you my thoughts on where we are and where we could go to next. So again, we actually found new all-time highs today on the S&P 500, but put in a bit of an outside day on a spinning doji and market pretty much finishing flat again, basically unchanged here, just after we broke out to all-time highs on Wednesday. However, it's not all good underneath the hood. Do have weakening breadth. We can see that in the Russell 2000, the most diversified index out there, actually losing its 50-day VWAP today. And overall, looking at NYSE, and NASDAQ volume breadth, the volume of stocks increasing versus the volume of stocks decreasing, a little on the soft side here, along with softening long-term breadth, amount of stocks above the 200-day moving average, kind of in a bit of a downtrend here. And we actually saw stocks making new lows outpace those, making new highs again today as well, with new highs and a bit of a downtrend. So the reason why we pay a lot of attention to market breadth is that it shows what the health of the overall stock market is. Because just looking at the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, it's a little misleading as they're very concentrated, especially nowadays, towards mega cap tech, who have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And you'll find with market breadth, it can often be a leading indicator. For example, just looking at a long-term weekly chart of the percent of stocks above the 200-day average, you'll see that actually peaked out back in April 2021 and started rolling over for a few months. And if I just overlay this chart with S&P 500, it actually kept on increasing. It didn't peak out until late December 2021 before we rolled over big time in 2022. And so you can see here, we've got another bit of a divergence happening. Not a real big one, but it is starting nonetheless. With market breadth kind of pulling away from the S&P 500. However, what's a little bit different is volatility. Volatility was increasing in the second half of 2021, going into the end of the year. However, now volatility is pretty much on the floor, 12.2. And a big move today, which I'm gonna get into a bit later on in this video, is a sharp U-turn in bond yields. There's the two year, up a whopping 16 basis points today, along with the 10 year, helping to give a sharp pullback in TLT. High yield bonds still hanging in there, dollar firming a lot, and Bitcoin. Good measure of liquidity and risk sediment, peeling back from these resistant highs as well. And just looking at market color, bit of a mixed picture. No real obvious prevailing trends there. And kind of mixed signals as well. We've got consumer discretionary green across the board. Volatility red across the board. The Russell underneath its 50 day now as well. S&P and NASDAQ holding up. High yield bonds negative. Momentum positive. So bit of a mixed picture there. However, to sum up all that and what to make of all that, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, I'd say we could be in for a period of consolidation and maybe a pullback next week with a sell the news event on Nvidia's 10 for one stock split. Apple developers conference and then going into the big one Wednesday, CPI inflation data could throw us a curveball as well. And it could be a case like we often see markets break out to new all time highs and they'll often consolidate, maybe retest back. And I'd say given the sharp increase in bond yields and that weakening breadth, along with the firmer dollar, I'd say that's a little bit of a headwind for the market right here, especially if we just come in off the back of a huge run up in Nvidia, which has really been driving the main indices. However, more thoughts on the market and charts later on. First, let's just pivot to the biggest story of today, and that's GameStop. And let me just run you through the events that have happened over the last 24 hours. New developments, along with all my analysis and thoughts on what it all means, 
and you may be surprised as to what I conclude after all this. So stick with me for a bit here and let's go through it all. Okay, just zooming out to last night and yesterday's session, we went on this huge run up. Keith Gill came out and said he'd scheduled a live stream on YouTube for the first time in three years. And as you know from last night's show, we had a huge rip right up towards the end of the post-market session, which trades from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. New York time. We sold off going into post-market close. Then the pre-market session opens at 4 a.m. New York time and runs to the regular session open at 9.30. We were kind of just tracking along there, hovering around $62 a share. Then we got the surprise early earnings release from GameStop. Shares immediately sold off going down to $52 giving up 10 points in quick fashion. They weren't scheduled to release till Tuesday. Then about 30 minutes later, they came out with a secondary offering, planning to sell 75 million shares at market. And that's of no real surprise, taking advantage of these high prices. However, it does dilute shareholders, increases the supply in the register, so stocks will always pull back from that. So we sold off hard after that news, actually trading down to $37 a share, where it found a little bit of support, Tried to hold ground there, actually ticked down to $35 a share where it did find support. Then we opened up the regular session, shot right up back to $48 a share. There's numerous halts during the day and which if a stock moves too much, five minutes, it'll get halted. There can also be discretionary halts, which there were, especially doing his live stream. So then the stock sold off into mid morning and then his live stream was scheduled to come out at 12 in which he was late, he didn't show up. So the stock sold off a bit more into that, finding new lows, 31.60. Then he showed up to his live stream. They halted it straight away. Stock popped into that, and then he was on the live stream for almost an hour, coming off around here, and then the stock kind of just traded flat in the afternoon, and here we are, just trading a little bit lower than the close, 27.40 as I speak. So that's the price action we got today, along with those key events, and let's go through them. Okay, so probably a lot of you did watch the live stream, and it was just Keith Kill, Roaring Kitty, being the same old self that he is. He's been a bit of a clown, speaking gibberish, kind of weird stuff. Um, he basically just reiterated, you know, he's all in on GameStop. It is actually him posting. He's not partnered with anyone. He still believes in the company. He's betting on Ryan Cohen. He still likes the stock. He was very careful not to do anything illegal. It's full of disclaimers. Just having fun, drinking beer, goofing around. And it's no surprise, a lot of people thought it was a bit underwhelming. Was, I mean, there's a huge buildup, big expectations. This guy's just a suburban guy trading an E-Trade account using Yahoo Finance. So just keep that in mind. He's not a professional actor. He even admits he's not good at video editing or anything like that. However, let me go on to why it's not all as it seems and actually make a bit of a case to why I think this may not all be over yet and it could turn out to be something that may surprise a lot of people. As right now, it looks all a bit theatrical and just kind of pump and dump type of stuff. However, stick with me for a minute here and I'll give you my thoughts on it. And I'd be interested to hear all your thoughts on it in the comments below this video as well. So there's no surprise he's getting a lot of negative publicity today. Stock crashed, which can happen a lot in a buy the rumor, sell the news event. We saw the same thing with Dogecoin and Elon Musk on an SNL. So the media's been quick to point that out, painting him off as a clown, and of course jumping on the big dive in the stock price. That's why we're getting headlines like this. Position loses more than 200 million. He's still holding all those shares, along with his call options as well. However, I think it's wrong to call this guy dumb. Let's not forget he parlayed $50,000 into over a quarter billion dollars as it stands now. And I think he knew what he was doing. Coming back onto X first with the memes, drove the stock up, GameStop sold some shares, it fell back down. Looks like he's loaded up on call options. Then he came back onto Reddit, pushed the stock up. Then he came back onto YouTube, ripped the stock up last night and GameStop the company took advantage of that by selling more shares. Now he knows that was very well and likely to happen and he's instigated that. He loves this company. He believes in Ryan Cohen. He's all in for the long run and say so he could have single-handedly helped the company replenish their balance sheet and give them a much longer runway to turn the business into a sustaining profitable machine. But of course on the surface it doesn't look like that and that's why you got clowns like Ross Gerber, one of the biggest financial influencers and I'm not sure why. Coming out and saying GameStop now plunging 40%. At some point, people will realize they are getting worked over by GameStop Ryan Cohen. This pump has allowed GME to dump 120 million shares on the public. No question they wouldn't have been able to do this without the kitty. First off, let's just keep in mind this guy has been proven wrong so many times it's not funny. He's been accused of engaging in PPP loan fraud, using his last name Kawasaki to claim he's actually a motorcycle dealership to get that government handout. He's actually a financial advisor and runs a wealth management firm. And a lot of people don't know this, but he actually has an ETF called the Gerber Kawasaki ETF. And you don't hear a lot about it and he doesn't talk a lot about it. And that's because it's significantly underperformed 
the market ever since it came on three years ago. Kind of similar to Ark Innovation and Kathy Wood. But anyway, I digress. And enough about this clown. Back to my point yesterday and that Keith Gill could be on a deeper mission. After hearing him today, I don't think so. I think it's more about he actually believes in GameStop. He's all in. And I don't think he's really trying to prove a point about the system and crooked hedge funds, naked short selling. And at this point in time, I don't think the SEC and regulators really have a strong case to stand on. He hasn't actually technically broken the law. And when it comes to the courts and that, that's what they actually look at, is whether the law was technically broken. And now that he's got the budget, he could fight them all day. And so for now, I don't think they want to get into it with him. However, that could easily change. Like I said, I think Keith Gill's actually a mastermind, even though he looks like a clown on the surface as well. Because I think he's allowed GameStop to become a lot stronger and have a better chance of becoming profitable in the long run. And so they took advantage of this and brought forward their earnings release, which was a bit of a surprise to the market. And just zooming in here to look at the numbers, net sales, $880 million for the first quarter, compared to the $1.23 billion in in the prior year's first quarter. Expenses 295 compared to 345 last quarter. Net loss was 32 million compared to a net loss of 50 and a half million for the prior year's first quarter. And they've got good liquidity. Cash on the balance sheet, a bit over a billion there with their long-term debt limited to a low interest unsecured loan. And so immediately after releasing earnings, they also announced offering us of 75 million shares at the market through Jefferies. They're gonna sell new shares on the market. And this is in addition to the 45 million shares they sold back in May after the last pump in which they raised $933 million. And so just calculating what price they were actually able to sell those shares for, they raised $933.4 million by selling 45 million shares gives us a price of $20.74, which I've actually marked on the chart here in the blue line. So that after that last pump, they came out with a secondary, raised almost a billion dollars. And what's interesting, if I draw a volume profile from the top of that last pump, to where we are here today, it's pretty much exactly the same price as where they offered those shares. So that's kind of the point of control, the technical fair value since that last pump, where the most amount of volumes traded, where I think Keith Gill reloaded along with some others, and obviously the market as well was happy to buy shares there. And we can also see that in my institutional buying indicator going green around the same time where I think Keith Gill got back in on his call option. And so I think that could be a bit of a flaw or a level of support on the market here. And I'll take my support box right up to that level. And just looking at previous price action where we've turned before around low 18s. And so we could very well trade down into this support box next week where we may find support again around the 2070. And if the market sells off a bit, maybe we go down to 19 or 18s as well. And so while Roaring Kitty's live stream was a little bit underwhelming, of course, the stock price was disappointing for those in it for the short term, hoping it was going to go to the moon today above $100 a share. I understand all of that, you know, for a short term gamble, probably didn't turn out for a lot of people the way they hoped to turn out. Although a lot of people did get out in post market after hours. I heard from a lot of you guys that did. So congrats on those who did for a short term trade. However, just stepping back, looking at the long term, this is going to significantly strengthen the balance sheet of GameStop because last time they sold 45 million shares at 2074, this time they're going to sell 75 million. And if they're able to do that at the same price again, 2074, that'll bring in a bit over one and a half billion dollars to add to their already over billion dollars in cash. So that'll take their liquidity up to over two and a half billion dollars. And keep in mind, they only lost 32 million for the first quarter. If you annualize that, it's about 120 million per year. And so if they've got two and a half billion dollars, even if they keep losing money around 120 million dollars a year, that gives them plenty of runway to get off the ground. You could kind of think of a business, especially a startup or struggling business or turnaround situation that's losing money or whatever, kind of like an airplane and the amount of capital, liquidity, shareholders belief as the runway. And so a lot of startups and struggling businesses fail because they run out of runway, they run out of liquidity, shareholders give up, the plane can't take off. However, after this move long-term, GameStop has been able to extend their runway by more than double. So that gives them plenty of room and time to turn this business around and make it profitable. And that's because they've got a cult-like following, which you should never underestimate. We saw that with Tesla, heaps of short sellers coming after it for years and years. Tesla, 2019, 2020, they had a huge cult following, ran the stock price up, super rich valuation, and during the last five years, they've been able to sell almost $30 billion worth of stock while keeping the stock price higher than where it started. Again, giving them a huge amount of liquidity, runway, power, confidence, from the staff, suppliers, and the stock price as well. So Elon Musk used his cult-like following to help the business actually take off. And that's not to take away anything from the brand or product quality either. It just helps when you've got a cult-like following. 
Because imagine you're running a business and for whatever reason, it's having a few tough years, it's struggling, and then you've got a few shareholders. And if those shareholders gave up on you, they didn't want to have anything to do with you anymore, they're never going to give you another dollar, then you'd pretty much close down the business. Like what would happen to GameStop. However, if those shareholders loved you, believed in you, were okay with you losing money now, and they wanted to give you more and more money, well then you're going to give it another crack, and then you've got much better chances at making it work now, because your shareholders believe in you, they're backing you, they're willing to risk their money with. And again, don't doubt who is now the CEO of GameStop, Ryan Cohen. Because like Ryan Kitty said today, a bet on GameStop is a bet on Ryan Cohen, and he shouldn't be underestimated, as he has a proven track record himself. He's a billionaire, while still being a young guy, and he's put his money where his mouth is. He's actually the largest shareholder in GameStop. And you thought Roaring Kitty's position was huge at 5 million shares. Well, Ryan owns 36.8 million shares. He's been on the board for a few years, actually started buying in 2020, along with Roaring Kitty, and then they just made him CEO in September last year. He's completely gutted out the C-suite, pretty much the only guy running the show, and he has over a billion dollars currently invested in the stock now as well. And he's the guy that actually founded Chewy.com, turned it into a multi-billion dollar company before he exited it, and it's still a very successful e-commerce business that he built from the ground up. So like I said, he's got a track record of knowing how to sell online and be a big player in a big market. And that's the direction GameStop needs to go in. It's a long pivot from their decades of operating physical stores to going into the digital world. However, it is a big market. Gaming, collectibles, and so he's all in on GameStop and with a cult-like following, willing to give it a rich valuation, run the shares up so they can sell more shares, replenish the balance sheet, They've got a huge runway, and with Ryan at the top, it could actually turn into something long-term. And because like Elon says, the most entertaining and ironic outcome is the most likely outcome. And don't get me wrong, it's going to be a very volatile and bumpy road, even if they can pull this off, still full of risk. However, after diving into it, I'm thinking of it a bit differently, and not to mention with just Ryan and the shareholders and backing them, but also Roaring Kitty and his huge following. Really want this to succeed. Just seeing a retail suburban guy turn $50,000 into hundreds of millions of dollars is certainly inspiring. And I don't think we've seen the end of this story just yet. And even though for now, things are definitely cooled down. See that in the options market, implied volatility pulling back, stock price pulling back, likely to remain under a little bit of pressure and potentially consolidate for a few more weeks. And who knows, maybe run down to the high teens again, $18 a share. Like I said, we may not have seen the end of this and GameStop could still be a rocket to the moon. Who knows, maybe in the medium long term, wouldn't it blow a lot of people away if it turned into a $100 billion market cap company? Currently around 12 or so at the moment. And it becomes one of the biggest players in gaming and collectibles online. And Ryan Cohen brings on Roaring Kitty onto the board and they're both filthy rich billionaires running one of the biggest gaming companies in the world. Who knows, anything's possible. Because just like Elon Musk is a bit different, this guy is as well, a bit autistic, something like that. And even though it all looks like theater now, and he's a bit of a clown. Like I said, don't underestimate him or Ryan Cohen and what they could be pulling off here. And more importantly, their cult-like following that are backing them until the end. Anyway, that's just all my analysis and opinion on it. I'm interested to hear from you as well. What do you think about what I've just said? And what are your thoughts on all of this? Just drop a comment below this video as I read and respond to everyone. Moving on today to the second biggest story in financial markets, the US jobs report coming in a lot hotter than expected at least the headline number anyway. And my forecast yesterday was right. I thought would come in at 4%. Unemployment, that's what we came in today. US economy added 272,000 new jobs last month in May, well ahead of economists' expectations of 190,000. And that also came with a bit of increases in average hourly earnings as well. Most notably in business services, education, health, and hospitality as well. And just looking at the prints we got, it's easy to see why a lot of people are confused today. Average hourly earnings, bigger than expected. Non-farm payrolls coming in way bigger than expected, but the unemployment rose higher than expected. So how do we get more jobs than expected with a higher unemployment rate? Well, that's a lower participation rate, meaning there's just more people available for jobs in the market, and that's what shot the unemployment rate up. Have a look underneath the hood of the jobs data. It's not all as it seems either. Household survey continuing to show a much softer employment picture, along with full-time employment. So just don't forget in non-farm payrolls, that includes full-time and part-time jobs, and full-time employment has actually been downtrending this last little while. And that's typically what we see in recessions and bear markets as well. And just looking since May last year, it's actually been a huge increase of part-time jobs versus full-time jobs that have been lost. And keep in mind, native-born Americans as a whole have actually lost jobs since 2019. All of the new job growth has come from foreign-born Americans, both legal and illegal immigrants. Also got some other bearish economic data today with daily card spending 
per household, major categories. Diving off this last week, entertainment, furniture, and home improvement, discretionary items. Consumers are definitely pulling back on their spend here, tightening the belt. However, at the same time, Wall Street analysts are lifting their expectations for what companies are going to make in earnings per share this year and next year as well. So how does that happen? Jobs markets weakening, consumers pulling back discretionary spend, but companies are expected to make more money. Well, for starters, S&P 500, almost half of their revenue is derived from offshore because there's big global tech companies, so it's not all related to the American consumer. Second of all, these companies have been doing a great job at cutting costs, becoming more efficient over the last couple of years, laying off a lot of people. And that's thanks to the same theme that this bull market's running on artificial intelligence. Big companies have already started replacing humans with machines to do exactly the same job. And that's a trend that's only going to accelerate and grow over the coming years. And it's kind of a little bit dystopian, isn't it? If the companies and stock market keeps getting bigger, well, more and more people get laid off jobs. And what's the end goal of all this? Even if it is 20 or 30 years, no one needs to work. Jobs become a thing of the past, just universal basic income. And what people are supposed to just sit on the beach or play golf all day and the government just sends you a wage. It's kind of interesting future we're going into. And this is why corporate profits could still hold up and maybe what's different this time compared to the past correlation. Because now we're starting to got machines replace people and this could affect pretty much every sector and industry out there automated buses robots doing dentistry work and who knows maybe robot teachers as well but just keeping in mind regardless of all that stepping back looking at the long-term picture a forward 12 month PE ratio in the S&P 500 still a little elevated the blue lines a 10-year average green line is a five-year average currently sitting just below 21 only really higher than that back in late 2020 going into 2021. So the stock market's still pricing in really good growth over the next year or two. And if we do get a recession and that does hurt corporate profits, well, then there's definitely room to fall in the stock market technically and looking at valuation metrics as well. However, just keep in mind, it's not the same as the late 90s because that was a rally led by junk stocks, unprofitable companies. Whereas this time I've got a much better correlation between earnings, the fundamentals and the run up in the stock price, unlike the huge divergence back in the late 90s. So once again, we're getting a little bit of mixed economic data, definitely signs of softness in the jobs market. Even though the headline numbers coming in hot, thanks to the sharp increase in part-time jobs, is not historically a good thing for the economy or markets. But if you want to know what to make of it all, well then just follow the tape. As the market never lives, and we definitely saw a sharp increase in bond yields today, reacting to that jobs market report, like we can see in the two-year yield, now sitting just below 490 again. So the bond market market obviously thinks this is bad for the chances of getting a rate cut anytime soon as you could think of the two-year yield as kind of like a leading indicator on what the Fed's going to do. Quite often the Fed will just chase a two-year around. So with that price action I think it's safe to say we can forget about a rate cut anytime soon and we can see that with Fed fund futures actually pushing out the probabilities now. It's about two-thirds chance we get a cut in November. They were previously pricing it for September. However this will change a lot going into that as well because we got CPI coming on Wednesday and if that comes in soft, I think the Fed would love to go ahead and cut in September if they could, especially after ECB and Bank of Canada has done the same as well. And it's moving on to commodities. Oil's been really weak these last few weeks. Just found its footing over the last couple of days. Still in a technical downtrend though. Didn't seem to have a huge reaction off today's jobs report. It had been thinking maybe oil, just like bond yields, maybe pricing in a lot of, a lot of economic weakness around the corner. Now it's kind of a muted response there today. What did have a big response today was gold, down 2.7%, which is a huge move for the normally low volatile gold on above average volume, helping to bring down its smaller brother of silver as well. Both having lost their 50 day VWAPs here. And that's for two reasons. The chances of a rate cut getting pushed out, which gold doesn't like, because if rates were going to get cut, that makes gold more appealing as a non-yielding asset. However, we also got, it's got news that China is going to pull back on their buying after their 18-month buying spree. And that's not necessarily a bad thing long term. I think they've actually made a smart move because the whole markets were catching on to their buying trying to front run them, driving the prices up. They know the whole world's aware of their buying and they don't want to cause a bubble there. However, don't get them wrong, I still think they want to shift more and more of their reserves into gold long term. They may just be trying to talk down the market themselves and I expect them to buy the dip. They just don't want to let the price get away from them too much. And we've already seen gold just overtake euro in global international reserves. And who knows, maybe we're on a trend where gold becomes the biggest reserve again, overtaking US dollars, a trend that's already been underway for almost a decade now. And we can see that in this chart here of gold's global international reserves share still underneath 20%. US dollars lost 50% and that big divergence over the last 30 years could be set to close in a lot further over the coming decade or so. And whilst we're on China, 
their economy is coming back. The world's factory exports rising by 7.6% in May from a year ago, well ahead of expectations of 6%. Whilst they're doing less business with the West, US and EU, they're doing more business with the BRICS nations, Russia, Africa, who they heavily want to influence and invest in infrastructure as Africa is actually the most commodity rich continent in the world. They just don't have the infrastructure to dig it all up. China wants to partner closely with Africa to secure their long term supplies of commodities and the street starting to come back to the China trade as well. Analysts expectations, fund managers allocations coming off those rock bottom lows. People are turning around on China. However, technically speaking, it's still pulling back here. Just having lost its 50 day VWAP today. And if I drew a Fibonacci on its last swing up from mid-April till mid-May, it's just done a 50% pullback. We may come down, do that 62% pullback, or even a deeper 78% pullback down to $25 a share. That's all possible over the coming week or two. However, I think that's a good buy in the dip opportunity because just zooming out to a long-term monthly chart on China, looks like we put in a solid double bottom in January. We've run up for four straight months, so it's no real surprise to have a bit of a pullback consolidation. But I'd be surprised if we got back down to these low 20s again. We may not see that ever again, potentially. Doing a lot better though is my pick, Tiger Brokers, adding on another 5.9% today after we got their earnings two days ago, in which they missed expectations, but the business is still growing and healthy. And next week could be another juicy one. We've got Nvidia doing their 10 for one stock split, multiplying the amount of shares on the register by a thousand percent. Common move companies would do when the stock price runs up to a high price. Allows for more smaller investors to get in, better liquidity in the options market. Also on Monday is Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference, which they're set to unveil all their latest products, how they're getting into AI. And it'll be interesting to see whether the market uses that as a liquidity event to show Shuffle their hands and maybe we get a big pullback in mega cap tech pulling back the S&P and NASDAQ with it. There's a look at Nvidia today pretty much closing flat got within a whisker of becoming the largest company yesterday off the open and Apple actually firming up in this resistance zone as it goes into its big event on Monday and it'll be interesting to see the market's reaction. If they're really pleased with what they see in here we could rip up above $200 a share. Otherwise, potentially with Nvidia, we could get a sharp fall. Like I always say, we won't know until we know. Over the economic calendar, Eurozone's GDP growth rate came in line as expected. Economy barely growing. Canada's unemployment rate as expected as well, 6.2%. We've already looked at US jobs data starting next week. Got a 10 year note auction, inflation data from China, and the big one Wednesday, CPI inflation data from the States. Headline expected to grow 3.4% year over year, along with the Fed, which we'll get to hear from. Going into Thursday, we've got PPI data, 30 year bond auction, and finishing out the week with Michigan Consumer Sediment Survey. Fear and Greed Index, still on the cusp of going in the fear zone, and that's thanks to really weak market breadth, as I've already pointed out to you. And Corporate Insiders, whilst they did a little bit of selling the last couple of days, yesterday, they kind of pulled back, not doing a whole lot of trading here. And just going back into the charts, looking at GME, we just finished post-market as I speak, finished down at 27.16 bit softer than when we closed regular session. And there's a look at the daily chart again. And we'll be keeping an eye on this one next week, but we may come back down to this support zone where it may find support once again. And Bitcoin, I thought was primed for a bit of our all time breakout. However, that's still yet to be seen on this candle today, pulling back on big volume along with market breadth and GameStop. It appears animal spirits will have to wait a little bit longer. And just like China, we've got to pull back in clean energy today. There's a spread of the Nasdaq versus the Russell absolutely ripping up and see tech back to taking a strong charge here. Discretionary versus staples, still a bit soft, although staples versus the spy is also soft. Gold mine is the worst performing sector today after being the best yesterday and the best performing sector financials once again breaking away from bond yields i hadn't really been like high bond yields and a bit of a pullback to the 50 day for the hot utility sector as well there's cannabis still trying to find support here and even though it's consolidating in a technically oversold zone we're not getting a huge bullish divergence on my dsi there's a little bit of signs of institutional buying however i've got a feeling it still may want to come down and test a little lower here before we get a bounce it's another one we'll be watching next week and we've gone a little bit into ot guys so on that note, I'll wrap it up here. Just want to say a big thanks to everybody tuning in this week, hitting that like button, helping the Click Capital channel to hit a record amount of views yesterday. And a big welcome to all my new subscribers. I look forward to interacting with you all going forward. And like I said, I make these daily market reviews and post them online around 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, about five hours after market close in New York. And so another interesting week, GameStop, Nvidia, and next week could be just as interesting with an Nvidia 10 for one stock split, Apple conference, CPI on Wednesday, and of course, maybe some further developments in the GameStop saga. Thanks very much for tuning in. Have a relaxing weekend, and I'll see you again Monday night. Cheers.